What's up guys? Today we're going to be talking about the gait cycle and in this video we're just going to tackle the normal gait cycle but stay tuned for some more videos on some abnormal gait patterns. All right to get us started here's an overview of one gait cycle and we define one gait cycle as initial contact to initial contact usually. Now you can actually pick whatever starting point that you want and when that same point comes around again, that's one complete cycle on the same leg. Uh, since gait is continuous, it doesn't really matter where you start, but most of the time you'll see people starting with initial contact. For ease, it's a pretty noticeable phase and it's a good point to get your mind wrapped around what's happening. During gait, there are a few things that our body has to do in order to keep us moving forward. And we're going to break that down into three tasks, three functional tasks. The first one is going to be weight acceptance. You actually have to put your foot down to start accepting the weight. The next one is single limb support. And that's gonna describe when we have one limb that's responsible for all of our weight bearing. And then last, we have to move our leg forward in order to progress and get to the next gait cycle. So we are going to go through the gait cycle twice in this video. The first time we're gonna leave out muscles and we're just gonna talk about what happens in each phase. Then the second time we will add in our muscle activity. We have two sets of terminology, the Rancho Los Amigos, which is gonna be listed first and traditional terminology, which is gonna be listed in our parentheses here. Uh, it's important to know both of those. I think you're going to see the Rancho terminology used a little bit more in the real world, but the NPTE may still ask you about both kinds, so try to get used to it if you can. Okay, so let's start with our initial contact, which is also known as heel strike. And in this phase, we are starting to contact the ground with our supporting limb. Usually the heel is what strikes first if we have a normal gait pattern, and we are initiating something known as the heel rocker. So essentially, we're gonna roll over our heel until our foot is flat. Okay, second response is gonna be loading response. That's when our foot starts to go flat onto the ground and we start to accept weight. So we're still doing task number one here. And in this position, we need a lot of weight bearing, which means we need stability. We're gonna to have to absorb shock as we put our foot down and start to put our body weight on our limb. And we, as always, we still have to be moving forward through the whole cycle. Mid stance will follow loading response and we are transitioning to our second task. So now one limb is going to support our entire body weight. And as you can see here, we're almost directly in line with our body over our foot. As we transition to terminal stance, we're still in our single limb support phase. And this is where we're gonna transition from our heel rocker to our forefoot rocker. And so that just means that we've rolled over our heel and now we're going to start bending at those MTP joints in order to initiate that forefoot rocker. All right, so during pre-swing, we now transition into task three, which is gonna be our limb advancement. This is gonna prepare us to unweight our limb so that we can start to uh, take it off the ground and swing it forward. So during our initial swing here, we've now picked the limb up and we are initiating movement uh, in our swing phase. It, this phase is gonna involve clearing our foot from the ground and we're actually almost three quarters of the way through our gait cycle before our foot even leaves the ground. In mid swing, we're still advancing that limb forward. Um, we don't wanna pick the foot up too much because our body is trying to be smart and conserve energy. So we're just going to basically barely clear the foot so that we don't have to use as much muscle uh, recruitment. And we'll talk about that when we talk about our muscles. And terminal swing, we are starting to slow our leg down. So the limb is still advancing, but this is gonna be the last phase of our normal gait cycle. And the body has got to prepare itself for another gait cycle on the opposite extremity. So here's a wrap up of that normal gait cycle with our three phases that we talked about, our three functional tasks. 
We've got weight acceptance, we have single limb support, and we have limb advancement. And all three of those tasks have to occur during each gait cycle on each limb so that we can efficiently and effectively progress our body forward. Okay, so let's go on to our muscles as those are a huge part of our gait cycle. But what we're gonna do is try to break it down into two ideas that we can use during each phase. So the body can either generate energy in order to move a body part, or it needs to remove energy in order to control our movement and our progression forward as we go through, again, our normal gait cycle. So in this round of looking at the gait cycle, we're going to look at two phases in sequence because as we know, the gait cycle is continuous and we've got movement consistently progressing. So we sort of want to think about it in those terms as well. That'll make it a little easier. We also are going to go joint by joint and we're gonna look at the hip first, the knee second, and the ankle third, so that you have a little bit of a breakdown as you're trying to study everything that's happening during the gait cycle, because it's a lot. So hopefully this will give you a way to make it a little bit more manageable and or make it easier to study. That being said, I will tell you, you're probably gonna to have to roll through this video a couple of times. And by a couple, I mean five or more times in order to really understand each phase of the cycle. All right, so starting with initial contact to loading response, we see that the hip starts in flexion at initial contact and moves to a little bit of extension in our loading response. So we know that our hip is extending, but we need to know are we generating energy to extend it or are we removing energy to control the hip extension? In this case, we're moving quite a bit from flexion to extension and we don't really have any momentum going that we know of. So that's gonna require that we are using our concentric hip flexors to get that hip moving into extension. If we look at the knee, we're starting in the relative knee extension and we're going into slight knee flexion. It's a little hard to see on the picture, but what we know is as our foot is flattening to the ground during our loading response, we're also accepting our weight. That's our functional task that we talked about. So since we have to accept some body weight, we're gonna need a little bit of shock absorption. So if you think about it that way, when we move our knee from extension to flexion, we're doing knee flexion, but we're gonna to have to control this motion. So we need our eccentric knee extensors working for us in this um, phase transition. Finally, if we look at the ankle, we start in either neutral, maybe a little bit of dorsiflexion, and we're moving to some plantar flexion in order to put our foot flat on the ground. Again, we've got gravity kind of assisting us as we're going, so we're gonna think more control during this phase than generation. And we see that we need our eccentric dorsiflexors to help us control that plantar flexion down. So from initial contact to loading response, we got the hip extending, the knee flexing, and the ankle plantar flexing but we also have to think through, are we generating or are we removing energy? So at the hip, we've got to generate energy to extend it. At the knee, we've got to control it with our eccentric knee extensors. And at the ankle, we also have to control our lowering down to the ground with our eccentric dorsiflexors. Moving on, we are going from loading response now to mid stance. So let's start with the hip again and we still look like we're going into relative hip extension. We also don't really have any momentum that we have gained thus far, so it should be the same. We should require our concentric hip extensors to get that hip extension. When we transition to the knee, the knee tends to be the tough one. It's always the confusing one because it's the joint in between and because it has a lot of transition going on. So in this case, we got slight knee flexion that we had had in our loading response, and we definitely need to move to knee extension because we need a straight limb so that we don't collapse when we're in mid stance. So we actually have got two things going on at the knee. We have extension as our motion, but we are coming off of an eccentric 
um, transition and we now need to give a brief concentric to our knee extensors in order to get that straight leg for mid stance to bear our full body weight. Finally, the ankle is still moving into relative dorsiflexion because that tibia is advancing forward over the talus all the way from initial contact through mid stance. So if you think about advancing, we've got some momentum going there. So we still need control. And that's gonna require, again, our ankle eccentric plantar flexors to be working. So from loading response to mid stance, we've got the hip continuing to extend, we've got the knee transitioning from flexion to extension, and we've got the ankle continuing to dorsiflex mainly through momentum. So we still need to generate energy at our hip to extend it. We're gonna have to generate extension at our knee to support our leg, and that's gonna require that transition from our eccentric to our concentric muscles. And finally, we need to control that tibial advancement, so this is going to be, again, our eccentric plantar flexors at work. Okay, so from mid stance to terminal stance, we still have hip extension going on and it still needs to be generated. So we've got those concentric hip extensors. The knee is where we're still getting a little bit more complicated. And in this case, we've got that knee extension that we had gotten in mid stance in order to support our body weight. And we're moving into some slight knee flexion in our terminal stance. So we had said our concentric knee extensors were working, but if we're gonna do knee flexion, we're gonna have to have a little bit of concentric knee flexors after that. So our knee is again transitioning from concentric knee extensors to slight concentric knee flexors. So it's still concentric, but just a different muscle group. And then finally, from mid stance to terminal stance, we are gonna have a little bit of plantar flexion. And this is where we start to push off the ground in our terminal stance. So we need to generate our energy. We are finally going to be using some concentric ankle muscles and we're going to be needing our concentric plantar flexors. So from mid stance to terminal stance, we've got the hip continuing to extend, the knee is gonna slightly flex, and the ankle is gonna transition to plantar flexion. We need a lot of generation. This is kind of the middle of our stance phase. So we gotta go from behind us to starting to push off for our swing phase. So we've gotta generate the hip, we've gotta generate the knee, and we've gotta generate the ankle. Everything is gonna be concentric in this transition. All right, so from terminal stance to pre-swing, the picture is not, uh, a, a lot different between the two phases. So again, it can be a little difficult to kind of picture what's going on, but we have our hips starting to go into flexion because we need to now bring that leg that we just stood on through to start our swing phase. So we still have concentric muscles going on, but this time we've got hip flexors working. Our knee was in flexion and it's going to go to a little bit more flexion Throughout the swing phase, the knee needs about 60 degrees of knee flexion, which is actually quite a bit. So we know we're gonna be generating a lot of energy at the knee in the next couple phases. That would require our concentric knee flexors here. And finally, we've got our ankle that is still pushing off the ground. And so we are still needing our ankle plantar flexors here, working concentrically. And that will rapidly transition in our next phase that we'll talk about. But from terminal stance to pre-swing, we've got our hip moving into some flexion, our knee into some flexion, and our ankle continuing to plantar flex. And it's actually gonna have a peak plantar flexion activity. So again, we're in a high generation phase. We've got to generate a lot of energy at the end of our stance phase so that we can start swinging that leg. All right, we are officially on to our swing phase. So from pre-swing to initial swing, we still have some hip flexion occurring. So those concentric hip flexors. We still have our knee flexion because remember we have to hit our 60 degrees. So we've got concentric knee extensors and we still have a little bit of concentric plantar flexion occurring because we just bursted our foot from the ground in plantar flexion. And so we're still 
um, finishing that phase. And that's why we're still on concentric plantar flexion. That's gonna change real quick though, as we'll see in the next one. So from pre-swing to initial swing, the hip is gonna continue to flex. We need the knee to continue to flex. And the ankle is also gonna continue to plantar flex, but it's on the end of our plantar flexion. So we just pushed our foot off the ground. That's gonna be sort of the end of that plantar flexion phase for the moment. All right, as we are starting to get into our full swing, we still have our hip flexing, so we're using our hip flexors. We still have our knee flexing, so we're using our knee flexors. And now we have some ankle dorsiflexion going on, right? Because we've actually got to clear that foot from the ground. So we went from that plantar flexion that we needed to push off the ground. Now we need some rapid dorsiflexion happening. Again, a lot of generation of energy occurring. So from initial swing to mid swing, the hips flexing, the knee is flexing, and the ankle needs to start dorsiflexing and rapidly. So we're gonna have generation of hip flexion, generation of knee flexion, and ankle dorsiflexion. Okay, so from mid swing to terminal swing, our hip is still flexing, hip stays pretty constant. Our knee is still flexing, but we're finally getting to the end of that flexion that we needed to clear. And we still have to clear that ankle as we're swinging the leg through, so our dorsiflexors are still going to be working here. Now, the caveat for the knee is that once we are done with flexion in order to swing the leg through and in order to clear the ground, our body is gonna conserve a little energy by turning some of those knee muscles off. And that sort of happens from mid-swing to terminal swing. And as we start to move into our initial contact of the next leg. So from mid stance to terminal stance, we still have flexion at all of our joints and most of it's gonna be generation, but the hip and the ankle are gonna do the most work. The knee is going to be turning off throughout some duration of this phase. Finally, we have our terminal swing to initial contact. So we're ending one leg gait cycle and then we are using our other leg for our next gait cycle. Now we have just come off of our swing phase where we had a ton of energy going because we generated a lot of energy throughout that phase. So we need to control it before we hit our next initial contact. It's going to require a lot of eccentric muscle work starting with the hip where we're going to see our eccentric hip extensors working to control this hip flexion that we're seeing from terminal swing to IC. And our knee is going to do another transition moment. So we needed a little burst of concentric knee extensor activity to get our leg straight again. But at the same time, we need some control from our hamstrings so that we don't hyperextend and so that we're ready to contact the ground again. Finally, that ankle dorsiflexion is still working because we still want to make sure that we don't trip over our foot at the very end of our gait cycle so we see some concentric dorsiflexion action. So from our terminal swing to our initial contact, the hip is going to need some control as we move into flexion, but we're going to need to generate and control our knee kind of at the same time. And we are gonna need to continue the generation of our ankle dorsiflexion. All right, so hopefully that helped break the information down a little bit. I know there's a lot, so feel free to watch this a couple of times. The last thing I wanna leave you with is a couple of concepts that might help you wrap all of this together, especially when we add those muscles into our gait cycle. So our first tip is that muscles will always turn off when they are not needed to counteract our ground reaction forces. Your body's smart, your body's efficient, and it's going to wanna to conserve as much energy as possible whenever it can. Then our muscles will always need to be creating our forward progression for us. So when we walk, we're usually moving somewhere and that only happens because of our muscle energy. So besides helping us generate motion, uh, our other muscles are gonna need to help stabilize us because we have to support our entire body weight while moving through air and through gravity. And they play a pretty big role in that. 
Okay, so if a movement of a lower extremity joint is occurring in the same direction as the ground reaction force, then we don't need a concentric contraction uh, because we don't need to generate any energy. The ground reaction force is our energy and that's what's generating. However, that's where we are usually seeing our eccentric contraction um, because we're gonna probably need to control that ground reaction force. Conversely, if a movement of a lower extremity joint is occurring in the opposite direction as our ground reaction force, then we usually need that concentric contraction to overcome that force. So I hope this helped a little bit. Um, as you are reviewing your muscles, go ahead and start thinking through uh, which particular muscles are acting at which point. So this PowerPoint was just talking about hip extensors, knee flexors, and general categories. But you really want to know, well, is it my glutes working? Is it my quads working um, as you're going through? So that's a little bit of an extra tip See if you can add that in, and I hope this helped. As always, don't forget to click the links below to access a short quiz and some review questions.